Growing up, I played quarterback. And playing quarterback gives you the opportunity to make a lot of mistakes. And so when you play quarterback, one of the things that they have to teach you and that my mom and my dad, well, not my mom, I don't know why I said my mom, uh, my dad being my coach, uh, would have to tell me a lot is to have a short memory. Because when you go out on the field and when you throw an interception, you come back over to the sidelines and you remember what you've done wrong and then you get back out onto the field and you can go make the same mistake over and over and over and over. Because once it gets into your mind, then the ball, instead of just naturally coming out of your arm, all of a sudden you can be hesitant in what you're doing. And then because of that hesitation and because of what you're remembering, it can cause you to make a lot of mistakes. And so today what I want us to look at is I want us to look at Jesus. And we're going to fast forward a little bit. Um, as you know, as a church, we've been reading the Bible together. We've been in Matthew together and so what I want to do is I want to fast forward. We haven't got to this chapter yet in our reading, but I want to fast forward for this purpose. We're going to fast forward and we're going to look at the Lord's Supper today, that last supper with the disciples that Jesus had. And then next week we're going to rewind. And when we rewind, what we're going to do um, is we're going to look at Palm Sunday. I thought about doing Palm Sunday today, but then I just felt like it would make everybody super confused because Palm Sunday's next Sunday, but I was going to do it this week and stuff. And so I just decided we're just going to mix it up a little bit. Um, we're going to jump forward, jump backwards, and then on Easter, we're going to jump forward to um, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and what impact that plays in our life. And so today, if you have your Bibles, Matthew 26 is where we are, and we're going to start in verse 26, and it says this, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Then he took the cup of wine and he gave, it, um, and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and he said, Drink it, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. And it is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And it's interesting a lot of times... If you have a story or you come across a situation and in that situation where you have multiple witnesses and when you have multiple witnesses, it's interesting to hear what people have to say, even though they're watching the exact same thing, even though they have seen the exact same thing take place, when you stand back and when you hear them share their experience and their viewpoint of the story, a lot of times you get a different perspective. And a lot of times people will highlight different information depending who they are and really the background that they come from. And in this story, it's interesting. The picture here is Jesus is sitting in a room and having dinner with the disciples. And then while he's having dinner with the disciples and they're talking and having a conversation, Jesus grabs bread, he breaks it. And he begins to take a teaching moment for the disciples and he starts passing it around and he says, guys, this is my body. And he says, this is being broken for you. And he says, so I want you to take this, I want you to eat it. And when you eat this, Luke says this that Matthew left out. Luke says this, do this in remembrance of me. And so it's the same room, it's the same scene, but Luke picks up on something that maybe Matthew just didn't feel like it was super important in order to put in there. And so then he grabs and he takes the cup and he picks up the cup and he passes it to his disciples and he says, this is my blood, which has been shed for you. He says, now do this in remembrance of me. And so what I want us to do is as we think about taking this together as a church, and a lot of times we may flippantly walk through this and we may flippantly just kind of, you know, okay, let's drink this grape juice, let's eat this cracker, and let's go home. I want us to really think and set the scene and think about what the disciples were going through and what they were walking through right there in that moment. And as Luke kind of guides us, he says, do this in remembrance of me. See, here's the thing, the picture that we have right here in Scripture it's more like a picture. When you go on vacation, what do you do? You snap photos. 
I heard a comedian talking. Uh, my, Heather was playing this comedian for me. And uh, we were listening to him, and he was talking about the difference between a grandparent talking about photos from her day and age to 50 years from now, a grandparent sharing with their grandkids. And she says 50 years ago, what they would do is, you know, they would begin talking about the struggles in life and how, you know, we didn't have TVs back then. You know, this is a picture of our house. And the kids are like, where's the TV? And they're like, we didn't have one. You know, this is a picture of our car. And she's like, what in the world? It's a horse and a wagon. I know, you know, like that's what it was like back then. You know, uh, this is a picture of our phone. Like it's a cup with a string and a cup. Like that's how we, you know. Uh, and, and just talking about those photos as they would take pictures and then go forward 50 years. And a grandma is sitting there talking to her kids, to her grandkids. And she goes, this is a picture of my breakfast that I ate <laughs> one morning. This, you know, is a picture of my closet. This is a picture of a dress I almost bought, but I actually didn't buy. I was thinking about buying that. And how pictures have changed over the years. How it used to, it would be, you know, I mean, it's a picture of the Eiffel Tower. And now it's a picture of a coffee cup, you know, with a, you know, the perfectly placed coffee cup with everything on the plate. I've watched people as we go into a restaurant and their food comes and sets in front of them. First thing they do is they grab their phone to take a picture. And I'm like, like, what? Why do you want to remember that? Like, what is it that you're capturing in that moment? And then I watched one time, a wife got so mad. I mean, so mad. She was fuming because she, she had her phone up and her husband grabs his fork and stabs her plate and messes it all up. <laughs> and I thought she was going to come out of the chair at him. And she was just like, you know, like, it's just food. Calm down. Like, eat it. Like, we don't want a before and an after. You know what I mean? Like, just, just leave it alone. Uh, and so, but here's the thing about pictures. That's what the disciples are trying to paint. Because you remember going to weddings and they would give you those, you know, yellow little wind-up cameras. And you would wind them up, leave them on the table and snap as many pictures as you could and set it down. And then they'd go develop them and everything. Um, it was the craziest thing. I was at a basketball game the other day. And it was for homecoming. And there was a lady, and I hope she's not in here. Um, but if you are, just be prepared. We're going to laugh. Um, she was standing there with a yellow wind-up camera. My kids look at me and they go, Dad, what is that? I was like, it has not been that long. Like, come on. They were like, what is that noise and what is she doing? I'm like, that's, a, that's what a camera used to look like. Uh, but here's the thing. Pictures are interesting because what the disciples are doing here is they're taking a picture and trying to paint that picture for us to understand and to set the scene. They have not recorded every word that took place when they were sitting there having dinner. And so what they did is they just recorded the major scene right here. They took a picture for us and they put it on paper so that now as we read this, we can begin to paint the scene that was taking place. And so the disciples are sitting in a room with Jesus and they're having dinner. And Jesus breaks that bread and he passes it around. He grabs the cup and he passes it around. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. It's been broken. It's been poured out for you. And then he says, do this in remembrance of me. See, that's where I want to land for a little while is just remembering. Because our memory is really interesting. See, our memory either pushes us forward to greater things or it holds us back and keeps us from doing what God has called us to do. Our memory a lot of times affects our future. Because as we look back on in our memory and we pull up our memory, if God has not been a great God in our life, then we begin to question if He's going to be a great God in the future. And if we haven't seen God work in great ways in the past, we wonder, can He work in great ways in the future? And so what Jesus is telling His disciples right here is, I'm going away and I'm not going to be with you anymore. And so these memories you need to hold on to. And you need to remember everything that I've done. And so the first thing that I want us to look at and I want us to remember is this. We have to remember the purpose that God had called the disciples to. Can you imagine them sitting around the table and as they're sitting there, Jesus looks and he goes, guys, when you take this, 
Do this in remembrance of me. Hey, Peter, you remember that first time we met? You remember what was going on? You had been out and you had been fishing all night long and you had caught nothing and you were ticked. And you were coming up on shore, you were messing with your nets, you were trying to get them just right, and you had worked so hard, but yet you came back empty. And remember me walking up and saying, hey, can I borrow your boat? And you looked at me really weird, and you were just like, what are you talking about? And he was like, can I just push me out there, just let me borrow it for just a little bit. And he said, remember I stood on your boat and I preached to all those people that were on the shore? And he goes, and then remember I told you to throw your net? And you looked at me because you're the professional fisherman and I'm not. And you look, I, I've been out all night, man. Like, you didn't know me at that point. Like, I was just a guy passing by. And I said, hey, why don't you try throwing your net over there? And what you have to understand is what Peter would know in this situation is that throwing his net out wasn't an easy task. It's not like we pick up a rod and a reel and we can just throw something out there and reel it back in. And if Jesus says, hey, throw one out there. No, it's picking up massive nets, making sure they're untangled, and throwing them out into the water, and then pulling them back in. And so it wouldn't be an easy task that Jesus was asking Peter to do. And he's like, you remember that? Remember how you were frustrated in your mind that I was asking you to do this? But yet you did it anyway? He goes, Peter, what happened? And the disciples are sitting there. They've heard the story. They've sat around and talked and shared stories. There's nothing like friends getting together and sharing stories and laughing with each other. And that's the scene. And as he's remembering, he's remembering his purpose. And he goes, what were you fishing for? And he goes, fish? He goes, what happened? He goes, man, there were so many fish. He goes, I wasn't able to pull the net in. He goes, there was so much fish that as I tried to pull that net in, he goes, I couldn't even get it in. And you can imagine Peter, and he, Peter's kind of that tough guy, that strong guy. So you can imagine him standing up, you know, in front of all his buddies and going, it's not that I wasn't strong enough, you know, flexing for him, like, I'll, I'll whip any of y'all. It was a heavy net. There was a lot of fish. And they're all laughing and just, you know, getting after each other. And he goes, so what did you, I, we pulled friends together and they pulled the net in. He goes, you remember what I told you? And he said, yeah. He said, come follow me. And I'll make you a fisher of men. And he goes, man, that, can, can you believe that was three years ago? Can you believe it's been three years, Peter, since that moment? Peter, you, you remember all those fish? That would have set you. You could have gone and bought a new boat. You could have hired you know, some people in order to help you. You probably could have sent out another fishing crew. Instead of just using one boat, you could have sent out two. And, and you could have had people working for you. That's how many fish it was. But I told you, your purpose is greater than what you see right in front of you. Your purpose is greater than just collecting a lot of money and being able to buy a lot of things. And he goes, Peter, you remember that? You remember three years ago how your life was changed from that point to where it is now? You remember how I drew you out and I said, follow me. Because what you're seeking after and what you're trying to discover and who you're trying to become, I, I, I want to change your purpose completely. I, I want to change your direction totally. I, I've got something better and something greater for you. Come follow me. And he said, you left everything and you followed me three years ago. He goes, you, you remember that? Yeah. Man, it's been worth it, hasn't it? Yeah. It hasn't been easy. But man, it's been worth it. You remember? And he starts looking at all of Matthew. You remember? You were sitting there collecting taxes. And you were taking money from people. And you wore all the fine robes. And you were one of the richest people. Because you could charge as much as you wanted tax-wise. And the way that they worked in that day and age is basically the king would set a price. And then the tax collectors would go out and they would have to collect that price and give that to the king. But here's the thing. They could then raise the price as much as they wanted, and then they could pocket however much they raised. And so what Matthew was doing is if the king charged 10%, he was charging 15 He was giving 10 to the king and putting 5% in his pocket. And so he was getting rich, and people hated the tax collector, and Jesus comes by and says, Matthew, I got something greater for you. I got a greater purpose. Like you're getting up every single day, and you're seeking after what the world would tell you you need to do. You're seeking after what you feel like you need in order to fulfill you. 
in order to discover your purpose. But I'm telling you, there's a greater purpose out there. Follow me. Guys, can y'all believe that's been three years ago? Three years ago, I called you to follow me. See, what you have to understand is you're sitting here today, not on accident, but on purpose. Because God created you with a plan. God created you with a purpose. You're not accidentally here because two people got together and all of a sudden you came. God strategically placed you here in Sepulveda, Oklahoma, in order to make a difference in people's lives. Not to chase after the things of this world, but to chase after Him with all of your heart. To go after Him with everything that you have, with everything that you desire, and to say, God, I want to go after you, and I want to seek you, and I want to become who you have created me to be, and I want to fulfill the purpose that you have created me for. And he's trying to get the disciples to remember their purpose because their purpose is going to be key once he's gone. Because once he's gone, they have to remember their calling. And they have to remember who he is. Because here's the thing. Life does not get easier when Jesus leaves. Life got harder. And so Jesus is trying to get them to remember. And he says, as as much as you come together, you need to do this. You need to remember. Because a lot of times it's your memory That gets you down the road. Think about it in a fight with a spouse. When you're mad at each other. I don't feel. I know I love you. But I don't feel like I do right now. What is it that keeps you going? It's the memories in the past. That can push you forward to a greater future. It's not the moment where it's a struggle. And where it's hard. Where it's frustrating. And where you're not getting along. But it's remembering why you walk down the aisle. It's remembering how you fell in love. It's remembering the good times together. It's remembering the way that they laughed, the way that you, you you danced together in the kitchen. It's remembering those things when times are hard that pushes you towards the future. And that's what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to do. He's trying to get them to remember so that their future can be brighter than their past. Because he knows what is coming. And so then he focuses and he says, hey, I want you to remember your perspective. Guys, you've walked with me for three years. You've seen what nobody else has seen. You've sat under my teaching. Remember when when I talked to you about being salt and light? Remember when I talked to you about what you were supposed to be? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. That light cannot be pushed back by the darkness, but the light overtakes the darkness and overcomes the darkness. That's who you are. Remember when I talked to you about that, guys? Remember what I said? You're the light of the world. Remember when they came up and they asked me, what's the greatest commandment? Remember what I told you? And they're sitting there and they're talking and he's like, yeah, love God, love others. Like the greatest thing that you can do in life is just love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and then love other people that way. That's the greatest thing that you can do. And he says, guys, you have a different perspective than everybody else because you've sat at my feet. I can't wait to get to heaven and have a conversation with the disciples of what it was like sitting around at night when nobody's around. You know, for us, like going home for Christmas and going to my parents or going to my in-laws, and when the kids go to bed and the TV's off and everything's quiet, and we just sit around and we just talk. And we just share stories and we just laugh and we just have fun. Like, I want to know what it was like for the disciples. When the pictures weren't being taken, when the cameras were off, when the followers weren't around, and it was just Jesus and the disciples. And he's saying, you were sitting at my feet having a conversation with me, hearing things, being taught things. He says, you you have a great perspective. He says, but not only... Just in my teaching. But in what you saw. My miracles. And you can imagine as the disciples begin to pipe up. And they're like. I remember that one time Peter almost drowned. (laughs) You know. You walked on water. (laughs) More like drowned. You know. And they just. You know. Nudging each other. Having fun. And then they start to talk about that story. You, You actually remember that guys? Remember right before that, we were sitting on that hillside. There was 20,000 people in front of us, and Jesus was talking, and they were all locked in listening to what Jesus had to say. And then remember how we got nervous because we were like, well, 
One, like we can't get a hotel, a hotel room for everybody. And two, we can't feed them. So we need to send them back down to town. Remember that? And we were like, Jesus, send them away. And he's like, no, let's feed them. And we're like, what do we feed? He's like, he's got five loaves and two fish. He's like, perfect. It's enough for everybody. They're like, remember what happened? How we came over to Jesus and he's just breaking it off and putting it in our basket. And we're having to carry that basket up the hill all around to the people. And we're letting them get their food their bread and their fish. And then we would come back to Jesus when it was empty and we would go get more and we had to feed 20,000. Remember how long that took? Remember how tired we were? And then when we were absolutely flat out exhausted, Jesus told us, hey, go make sure they're all full. Like Not that they just got something to eat, but that they are completely and totally full. Like Make sure they're, they're, they have a no walker going on. You know, when you eat so much, you just can't get out of the chair. You're just like, oh, oh. You know what I mean? Like that Thanksgiving meal where you're just like, oh, and you just don't want to get up. Like he's telling you, now go back. So they're walking back through with that big bag, and they're going through, and they're passing out food, and everybody ate and was completely full. Remember what he had made us do after that? We had to go collect all the food, and we all had a bag full of food that we had to carry. Remember how heavy that food was as we had to walk back to the boat and get in that boat and carry that food to that boat and then as Jesus pushed us away remember that storm remember how dark it was that night and it was just so dark that night and you could just hear and feel as the lightning would strike your hair on the back of your neck would stand up as the storm came in remember how big those waves were man that was scary and then Jesus man you freaked us out Holy cow, walking on water? Are you kidding me? Coming towards us? What in the world were you thinking? Like, announce yourself a little sooner. John wet himself. Remember that, John? And they just sit and have a conversation laughing about what had taken place. And then Peter starts talking about that. And he's like, oh. he's like, I remember yelling, Jesus, if it's you, let me come to you. And he's like, all right, get out. He's like, remember stepping out of the boat? He goes, guys, I'll never forget. He goes, looking down and seeing the fish underneath, even though it was stormy and the water was so clear, I could see down. He goes, I was standing on the water, but I was still scared. I was holding on to the boat. He goes, I remember stepping out a little bit and walking on the water. And he goes, and then, he goes, the lightning struck, the waves got big. He goes, man, I I lost you, Jesus. I lost you. And I started sinking, but you saved me. And Jesus begins to sit and say, guys, do you remember over the past three years of everything that has taken place? I mean, do you remember when we were heading through town and that dad came running up to us? And as he comes running up to us, he says, Jesus, you've got to help my daughter. She's about to die. Please hurry. Come to her. And we start pushing people out of the way because the crowd is huge. And we're trying to get Jesus to hurry. And Jesus, man, you did not move fast at all. Like, you know, like that dad was freaking out and you just took your sweet old time and you did not move fast. He was mad at you because he wanted you to get to his daughter and he's trying to get you to his daughter and you're just walking like you got all day. And he goes, and then remember as the crowd was so big and we were bumping into everybody, Jesus turns around and he's like, who touched me? You're like, what? Like, Jesus, everybody, come on, buddy. Like, everybody's bumping into you. Calm down. He's like, no, I had some power. Leave me. You remember that? And as they're sitting there talking, and they say, yeah. Man, you remember the story of that lady? She had actually been struggling with a disease for 12 years. And she had been struggling so bad, she had gone to every doctor that she could possibly go to. She had actually spent every dime that she had in order to find a cure, but nothing brought a cure. And her last hope was pushing through and getting to Jesus. And you remember when she touched him? You remember how it changed her life? How one touch from Jesus completely and totally changed her? Do you remember? Guys, do you remember? But then do you remember in that moment of hope? Do you remember how tragedy struck? As that lady is receiving her miracle, that dad is getting news that his daughter has died. Man, do you remember the weight and the remorse of the crowd around us? 
Like it went from something that was just so exciting and just so beautiful. This woman who for 12 years had been sick and now a 12-year-old girl that we were headed to hopefully bring a miracle to has passed away. And do you remember that wait in that room with that crowd as they heard the news? She passed away. She died. She died. She died. She died. She died. It just spreads throughout the whole crowd. And you can just feel the weight. But Jesus continues to make his way. He puts his arms around his dad, the, the girl's dad and just walks with him. And just, we could, Jesus, what were you saying to him? We couldn't hear you. But you were just talking to him. What were you saying? We got to the house. You kicked everybody out. And Peter, John, y'all, y'all were the only ones that got to go in. And the girl came out eating a sandwich. Unbelievable. It was so cool. She was dead. Like y'all told me, she was dead. Everybody outside was crying. And then the next thing you know, she's walking out the front door. Hey, guys. Like, that's what the scripture says. It says that once, like, make her a sandwich. She's hungry. And they're sitting there and they're remembering these stories. And he's going, you remember this? You had a front row seat to all of this. You had the greatest perspective to everything. But then Jesus kind of changes. And switches, switches direction, in, in my view. And he says, guys, I want you to remember. Remember the power. He says, guys, as good as it is to have me around, he says, it's even better for me to go. He said, you remember that conversation? I I told you that I have to go in order for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to come. Because as great as it is to watch everything that I do, I want you to begin doing what I've done. See, all the stories that they were talking about, everything that they had heard, Jesus now says, And this is hard for us to wrap our mind around because if we were honest and we were to answer the question, would you rather follow Jesus and have him right in front of us and he is standing up here preaching to us or would you rather be filled with the Holy Spirit? We would probably say I would rather follow Jesus and watch him in everything that he's doing. And I would rather see him perform these miracles. I would rather see him preach these messages. I would rather have him talk to those people. I would rather see him bring the healing. And what Jesus begins to say to his disciples is, remember, guys, remember the comforter that I talked about? When I leave, there's a comforter that's coming. It's the Holy Spirit. And the same power that raises me from the dead is the same power that can now indwell you and live through you. And he says, you no longer have to watch on the sidelines. You no longer have to stand on the sidelines. But now you get in the game. And what you you have seen me doing now, Jesus is saying, I want you to do. Now what you have seen done through me, and as you've been standing on the sideline watching the games, I want you now to begin to do. My oldest son, Judson, he's nine years old. He loves the thunder. And he loves going to the thunder basketball games. And if the thunder's on, we're sitting there, we're watching games together, like he is just fed up with basketball right now. And, um, and so he's got every Thunder jersey, he's got their gear, he's got the shorts, he's got the um, shorts, he's got the basketball shoes, he's got everything. And so we were going to a Thunder game and he put on a jersey, he put on two jerseys because he wasn't sure which one they were wearing that day. And so he had two jerseys on just so he could switch when he found out what jersey they were having. And we go to the game and when we're driving down there, it was just me and him, he said, hey dad, he said, what do you think are the chances of me getting in the game? What do you mean, bud? And he goes, well, what if, like, what if Russell Westbrook, Paul George, Stephen Adams, Jeremy Grant, you know, Hamadou Diallo, you know, what if Terrence Ferguson, what if all of them get hurt? And they start looking into the fans for somebody to put in. And I've got the gear on. Like, I've got the shorts that they play in. I've got the shirt that they wear. Do you think they put me in? Like, honestly. He is 110% serious at this moment. And he's like, honestly, do you think they'll put me in? And I said, bud, I I mean, honestly, I think it's going to be a long shot. I'm not sure they will. I go, I've never seen it done before. But since you do have all the gear, and if that was to happen, like if literally everybody on the team got taken out, 
and they were looking for one person, they might put you in. I was like, okay, good, let's go. <laughs> but here's the thing. A lot of us are walking through life that way. We have the jersey, we have the shorts, we have the clothes, but we're sitting on the sidelines. We're watching everything take place in front of us instead of getting into the game and getting on the court. And Jesus is saying, now that I'm gone, listen, I want you in the game. I don't want you standing on the sidelines. I don't want you watching other people pray for people. I want you praying for people. I don't want you watching other people share the love of Jesus. I, I want you sharing the love of Jesus. I, I don't want you watching other people Perform miracles. I, I want you reaching out and believing and knowing that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is the Spirit that now lives in us. And He desires to work through us in order to do what He did when Jesus was on the earth. And Paul, in 1 Thessalonians, he, he talks about this and he says this, don't quench the Spirit. Here's what that means. That means you going to the faucet in the morning and you turning the faucet on as much as you can and letting the water run full speed out. What quenching the spirit means is you going and turning the faucet off and beginning to shut off the power that is at your resources, the power that's in front of you, the water that you have access to. It's you turning it off and then getting frustrated because you have no water. See, here's the thing. This is how we live on a daily basis. We're frustrated at God and the work that God is doing in our life because we quench the Spirit of God in our life. Because what we're doing is we're looking at God just like a faucet and we're going up to it and we're putting the cup for water underneath the faucet, but we're not turning on the faucet. Everything that we need is right there at our access. Everything that we need is right at our fingertips. It is inside us bursting to come forth. But yeah, we shut the water off and then we get frustrated because we're not seeing God do anything. Why ain't God working? Why ain't God moving? Why can't I hear from God? And all of a sudden, we've got the water turned off, but the Spirit of God is bubbling inside of us, just ready to come out. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that lives inside of us. It is better. This is the words of Jesus talking to His disciples. It's better for you that I go... And the comforter, the Holy Spirit comes. Because it's not you watching, now it's you doing. And then the next thing that I think was taking place as they were having conversations in that room is this. Remember the plan. Guys, I want to tell you a plan. When I go, I'm going to die. But then three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. Don't worry about those three. Like, I'm coming back. He says, but then after I raise from the dead, I'm going to go to the Father. My work on earth is done. He says, so here's what I need you to do. Matthew 28. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Guys, I'm leaving. Now it's your responsibility. Like, I, I'm not going to be here anymore. You've been watching for three years me do everything. You, you, when you have questions, you sit and you hear what I have to say. Now, it's your turn. Now it's your turn to go out and to be to people what they need. Now it's your turn to go love people the way that I have loved people. Now it's your turn to go respond to people the way that I have responded to people. Now it's your turn to tell people about what I've done, who I am and why I came. They've been looking for a Messiah. And even though they may have missed it, listen, there's still an opportunity even though I'm in heaven and maybe they were the ones standing there yelling, crucify me. Listen, there's still hope for them. And you're the ones that are going to take it to all people. Statistics say this. That 85 to 95 percent of people who go to church, who call themselves Christians, an evangelical church that believes in the Bible, that believes who Jesus is, that believes that people need Jesus for salvation, 80 to 95 percent of those people never share the gospel with anybody. 85 to 90 percent sitting in this room never share the gospel with anybody. 
And Jesus is looking at his disciples and he's saying, hey, now it's your responsibility. Like if this is going to spread, it's on you. If salvation's coming to your family, you've got to tell them. They will never know what they're not told. You can't expect your kids to learn and go to school and a teacher stand there silent all day. Just because they're in third grade doesn't mean they're going to learn everything in third grade if nobody teaches them. In order for somebody to understand and know who Jesus is, you have to tell them. And Jesus is saying, that's my plan. Guys, you are my plan. Like, you're my hope for this to become a great movement. It's on you. I've given you everything that I have. You have everything that you need through the Comforter, through the Holy Spirit. You have your purpose inside of you. You've seen me do it. Now you're filled with the Spirit. Now go do it. But here's the problem with remembering a lot of times. If you have to sit down, and when Jesus looks and says, this is my body that was broken for you, take, do this in remembrance of me. Or this is my blood which was shed for you, take, do this in remembrance of me. If the greatest stories that you've seen in your life come from Scripture, then it's going to be hard to follow God in the future. Because if he's not a personal God to you, and a God that's working in your life, moving in your life, then you're going to rely on other people's stories. And when you begin to rely on other people's stories and the strength of other stories, your future and the strength that you're walking in becomes a little weaker. Because if you have to look to somebody else's story and he's not a God that is doing things in your life, then you're missing what he wants to remind you of. I remember early on, for Heather and I, we were having our third child, Judson. We went to the hospital. Water broke. Go to the hospital. Everything's good. Everything's going great. It's progressing and everything. And then labor begins to take place and it begins to happen. And when Judson comes out, Normally, with every baby, it's, and that's pretty good, isn't it? Um, but when Judd comes out, it's quiet, and he's blue. And I remember just, I don't know what's going on. I'm just, I'm like, what? This is weird. And so normally, on the other two that we had have, I come down, and they're like, you want to cut the, um, I always say this wrong, umbilical cord, umbilical cord, the biblical cord. Um, you want to cut the biblical cord. And so I come down there to cut. Uh, but then on this, what they do is when he pulls him out, the doctor kind of looks and they kind of shake him a little bit. And it's weird because kinda, he's just like, you know, and, and they're shaking him. And so then she cuts it real quick. And the nurses grab him. And they run him over and they set him in this tray and I'm standing by Heather, and I'm just like, what is going on? And she's looking at me, and she's like, what's happening? And they're like, well, we just got to, you know, get him away, you know. About a minute goes by, still nothing, no noise. More nurses are rushing in. Nurses are running out, grabbing other nurses, and they are rushing into the room. Now we're about two minutes in, and still nothing. And Heather's sobbing, and I'm standing next to her crying, and she's like, what is happening? What is going on? I'm like, I... I I don't know. The only words that I could get out in that moment is, God, you are good, and we trust you. God, you are good, and we trust you. And in that moment, all of a sudden, alarms begin to go off. And you hear across the, across the entire floor, code blue, code blue, room seven. I'm like, that's our room. And they rush in, crash carts, and now nurses and doctors are running in and everything. And my little son's laying right over there lifeless. And all of a sudden, as we pray, and as we just close our eyes and just trust God, and in a moment where there should be no peace, God gave peace. Because in a moment, in that moment, we should be a wreck. It tore us up inside. But at the same time, there was a peace that came over us that I can't describe that only God gives in that moment. It is a grace that God gives for the moment. And in that moment, we just, both of us, without talking, 
says, God, you are good and we trust you. And just as quietly next to her head, God, you are good and we trust you and tears running down our face. Next thing we hear, ah! it was the greatest noise we had heard. But when I remember, I remember the faithfulness of God. I remember the goodness of God. I remember when Heather and I didn't have a dime to our name and a $5,000 check showed up at our mailbox. God said, give everything that you have away to the church. We wrote a check for every single thing that we had. And we gave it to the church. And literally could not pay bills, could not eat, could not do anything. Gave it Sunday. On Monday, walked out to the mailbox, not knowing this was coming, not knowing this was going to happen. It was a $5,000 check in the mailbox. Listen, I, I don't need your stories to know how good God is. Because God's been good in my life. God's been faithful in my life, and I have seen him work. And if God's going to do great things in the future, I have to remember the great things of the past. Because sometimes the struggles come. And he's looking at the disciples, and he's saying, remember, because I'm leaving. And you are the hope. And if you are the hope of the future, and everything that I've done in the past, I want to do in the future. But I want to do it through you, not in front of you. I remember as Heather and I, our youngest son, could not breathe. Rushed him to the emergency room. They have to put a tube down his throat in order for him to breathe. Out of the blue, this happened. And as we are standing there, the doctor literally comes out says this is not good he's got about 30 seconds to live shuts the door and we're left standing in the hallway and they're trying to get a tube down his throat and Heather and I both in that moment God you are good and we trust you how can we say that because we've seen you do it in the past God you are good we trust you. So when you take this, don't rely on other people's stories. Look to the faithfulness of God in your life. Look to the stories that God is creating in your life.